Welcome everybody to the Independent Sage Friday briefing. The question this week is whether you can simply declare a pandemic over by the force of sheer will. The government has triumphantly announced plans to scrap the rule to self-isolate, even for those testing positive for COVID at the end of the month. And this will be the first time since the start of the pandemic that isolation after a positive test won't be mandatory. The Prime Minister said he's announcing his broader plan for living with the virus on February the 21st next week. So where does that leave us? The current infection rates justify the government's decision to do away with one of the most effective measures that we have against the spread of infection. We're set to drop a measure which is a basic tenet of public health, the idea that an infected person should try to keep themselves to themselves and not spread infection further. So what will these changes mean for people in particular who are clinically vulnerable? Dr Helen Salisbury will be considering this question shortly. Letting this infection spread freely through a population also means that we will see a higher burden of long COVID. And so we're revisiting this subject, which we've covered before, but today with a special focus on long COVID and children to be led by Professor Anthony Costello. And we're delighted to have a couple of special guests with us as well to discuss long COVID in children. Dr. Benita Kane, consultant respiratory physician from Manchester University Foundation Trust, and Dr. Liz Whitaker senior clinical lecturer in paediatric infectious diseases and immunology at Imperial College London. But before we hear from them, I'd like to invite Professor Christina Pargel to share the latest figures with us. Over to you, Christina. Right, let me share my screen. So, yes, welcome to this week's numbers. Um, I'm not going to go through vaccinations this week because basically they've stalled and we're hardly doing any. Um, so everything I said last week still holds about that. So I'm going to cover briefly cases, give you an update on the Omicron subvariant BA2, talk a little bit about hospitals and deaths and just a bit on children and schools at the end to kind of um, lead into Anthony's discussion later. So firstly, tests. Um, so last week I pointed out that tests are falling, that has continued with PCR tests really dropping off a cliff and reported lateral flow tests also falling. Remember, you don't have to report a test and so we don't really know how many are being done. Um, positivity rates, the percentage of people testing positive is calculated only from PCR tests. And so really this measure is starting um, to mean a lot less. So I'm just going to show you it for this week. For in, um, this is England, Scotland and Wales because Northern Ireland calculated differently now. Um, this was the big Omicron spike um, at the end of the year. So basically they're quite flat with gradual falls in England and Wales. And if we look at Northern Ireland, we can see the big spike here, but it's actually been going up rapidly again over the last few weeks. Now, Scotland, as of, I think, yesterday is no longer publishing positivity rates. Um, Wales and Northern Ireland are about to change how they report cases. So really with that and the drop in PCR tests, this is going to be the last week I show these charts for the foreseeable future. Um, and I'm going to have to rely on the um, ONS infection survey, which is a weekly measure and a little bit lagged. Um, and if we look at cases, um, this is up to the 5th of February by nation. You can see what they're showing is everywhere falling, even um, in Northern Ireland, um, and reasonably, you know, in the Wales and Scotland are back to where they were pre-Omicron. Now, what I want to do is just take this up as a weekly rate up to the 26th of January, and the reason I want to do that is because then we can compare it directly to the ONS infection survey, which tests a random subsample of people. And so it does not depend on people getting tested or choosing to get tested. Um, so what that, what the cases are showing up 26th of January is that Northern Ireland is going up, but everywhere else is pretty flat with a slight increase in Wales. What the ONS infection survey is showing for the same time period is something very different. So yes, Northern Ireland's going up, but actually it didn't fall very much from its peak. England going up, Scotland going up, Wales went up sharply with the most recent drop. So this really is kind of highlighting 
kind of an increasing problem with cases. And we can look at that um, a little bit further. This is just a comparison of the ONS pre prevalence. So every week, the ONS Infection Survey publishes an estimate of the proportion of people in England who currently have COVID. So that's um, this red axis, and that's this red line going back to the summer of 2020. The blue line is the weekly sum of all cases in England reported to the dashboard. So that's this axis here. And you can see that pretty much up until Christmas, they follow each other pretty well, right? If something goes up in cases, it goes up in the ONS infection survey, they're not always the same. You can see that when you get a decline in cases, it comes a bit later in the ONS infection survey, which we've you know, talked about before. But since um, the beginning of the year, we see this. We see that, yes, there has been a fall in, this is the ONS, um, and, this, and then it kind of stops falling here. But cases have just continued to drop, and they've never been this far apart. And so, again, I think with cases reported to the dashboard, we can't really rely on them anymore either. Um, so again, you know, the, the ONS infection survey just remains really vital. And I think going forward, I'm just not going to be able to show that data anymore because I don't think we really know what it means. So looking at the ONS infection survey, um, this is over the last four weeks and it goes up to the 8th of February. So the issue with this is that it is lagged. It is about a week, a week, 10 days behind. Um, so this is on the 5th of February. You can see actually... Uh, England, Scot Northern Ireland and Scotland all actually increase, Northern Ireland much higher than the other nations and only Wales decreased, um, which is showing something very different to cases. So there have been reports that the ONS infection survey is going to stop in April. And I can't quite emphasise how bad this is. Um, you know, we're already not being able to rely on the dashboard data. It's very likely that the dashboard is also going to be wound down um, in the spring. But losing the ONS infection survey, it just that's what captures spread in an unbiased way. It captures it across nations, across regions, across ages, across occupations, variants. It looks at viral load. And it's the only thing currently that's routinely capturing long COVID. Um, and if we lose it, we'll be blind, you know, and, and it's just... You know, it, it, I honestly find it really, really upsetting just because, you know, this is the envy of the world that we have this. Very, very few countries have this. And we have it, and it's been incredibly important. So I would just say, you know, we, we cannot afford to lose it. Just looking at um, the subvariants, just to say that this is in England, BA2 here in red is still growing. It's about 14% of cases in England. Um, and the interesting thing is that it's growing very rapidly in Northern Ireland. So it's now, um, as of the end of January, was just over 40% of cases in Northern Ireland by now is likely dominant. Uh, the ONS Infection Survey today reported exactly the same thing, that it's about 50% of cases in Northern Ireland that they're seeing. So, and it could be that this BA2 variant is behind the continued rapid spread in Northern Ireland. But remember, the Northern Ireland also is the nation with the lowest vaccination coverage. Um, on hospitals, people in hospital in each nation is continuing to come down, which is good news. We're seeing admissions um, with COVID in England are continuing to fall very steeply, still higher than they've been outside of this wave, but they are falling and that is, is good news. But you know, we've seen really, you know, reasonably high levels of hospitalization with COVID ever since the summer, ever since we kind of Delta came and we released most of our restrictions. And that has consequences and it has consequences for how the NHS has the capacity to do its business. Um, and NHS England re just released its latest kind of um, key performance indicators. So I just want to show you a little bit about what's been going on in the NHS. Firstly, this is the percentage of people going to A&E who are seen within four hours. Um, I think it's meant to be something like 95% of people are seen within four hours. You can see now that 25% of people do not meet that. They're not seen within four hours. It's been gradually getting worse every year since you know, 2010, but it's certainly, um, this is a big drop because hardly anyone went to A&E during the first wave of COVID. 
but it's now higher than it's ever been. If we look at people who go to A&E and are then admitted to hospital, hardly anyone waited 12 hours to be admitted. If they were sick enough to need hospital, they got admitted. It was gradually getting worse. Um, this winter of 2019 was very bad, relatively. But this winter, it's just been something completely different to what we've seen before with 3% of people waiting longer than 12 hours. And this is kind of a signal of a system that's really under strain. If we're looking at non-emergency stuff, this is um, the, as, an, as a target that 92% of people are seen within 18 weeks from referral to starting their treatment. Again, since 2016, this has been steadily getting worse. It dropped off massively during the first wave. It got better but it hasn't ever recovered anywhere to near where it was this kind of stuck at 64% of people. And this is um, a kind of similar plot of people waiting longer than six weeks, which is the blue line or 13 weeks, which is the red line for diagnostic tests by month for England. And you can see again, there's suddenly this massive jump in people waiting when the first wave hit. Then in the summer of 2020, the NHS did have capacity to start addressing that backlog and they did address the backlog. And these numbers started coming down. But then the second wave hit and it stopped. But when we got to the summer of 2021, there wasn't any more the capacity to keep things going down because Delta hit and we've had, you know, um, people off sick, NHS staff leaving, and also a new wave of COVID that hasn't come. And now it's going back, it's getting worse again with Omicron. So the NHS is not in a position where it was pre-pandemic. And it's very, very far from that. Just looking at um, deaths now, um, this is the number of deaths within 28 days of a positive COVID test by date of death. You can see that peaked um, around mid-January and is now coming down, um, which is good, but it's coming down quite slowly. Um, if we look at it by death certificate, so actually with deaths with COVID as a contributing cause from death certificate data, you also see this is only goes up to 21st of January, but it looks like it's peaked around the same time. Um, and it definitely did go up with Omicron. So it's not that all deaths since Omicron were incidental, um, which some people have been saying that's definitely not the case. However, that said, if we compare weekly deaths from the dashboard that are just measured by you know, four weeks within a positive test to the ONS death registration data by cause of death, you can see that firstly, the dashboard was an underestimate um, in, the, in the alpha wave. And then really the two were pretty much exactly the same thing um, most of last year. But then just recently, we're seeing now that the dashboard is overestimating death. So actually some deaths on the dashboard are not from COVID, but with COVID, but we have still seen a marked increase in deaths from COVID with Omicron. And then finally, just quickly on children and schools, Again, this is from the ONS infection survey. You can see that rates remain highest in primary school aged children. Almost 12% um, of children had COVID in the week to February the 5th, but it is coming down. But interestingly, it's not coming down in secondary school children. There it's continuing to go up and almost 9% of them tested positive in the first week of February, which is incredibly high. Um, and actually, what is also a little bit worrying is, is the ONS reported an increase in the um, over 50s, which we're seeing here. So obviously their, their overall rates are still lower than other age groups, but it's going up, um, which is a little bit of a worry, particularly you know, as, as boosters are waning. And just to point out, um, in Northern Ireland, the ONS estimate of Northern Ireland had incredibly high rates here of infection in children. This is age on the x-axis. So on the 5th of February, they estimated that more than 20% of two to five-year-olds in Ireland had COVID, which is just incredibly high. And I, and I don't know what can explain that apart from potentially um, the BAT variant. If we look at absences in schools, they are now starting to come down. Um, they're still higher than at any point previously from COVID, but they are now starting to come down, which is good news. And we're also seeing that hospitalizations in children are coming down quite steeply just over the last week or two. So that is also really good news, although they still remain higher than they've ever been at any point pre-Omicron. And then finally, just a slide on long COVID, this is from the ONS again, of the percentage of children living with self-reported long COVID for at least four weeks. And you can see 
um, that for both primary school children and secondary school children, although you know it's it's less than two percent. This is two percent of all children, not two percent of children who got COVID. Two percent of all children. Um, it has been going up, and it increased quite a lot when kind of the the infection rates from last term's wave fed through into the data. We haven't seen. There's no data yet on any impact from Omicron. So that is still to come. So just to summarize, I'm gonna to move to the ONS infection survey in future for cases, um, including regional and age spread. That means it will be a bit lagged, but much more reliable. Um, but it does kind of feel a little bit as if we're you know, <laughs> losing our sight slowly. Um, hospital admissions are continuing to come down. Deaths have peaked and are also now slowly coming down, which is good. Um, the Omicron variant BA2 continues to increase in all nations. It's probably dominant now in Northern Ireland. It's likely to be dominant in England within a couple of weeks. Um, exactly what that means, we don't really know. And it really depends very much on whether it can affect people who have BA1. And I think we don't think it can, in which case it shouldn't have too bad an impact, but we don't know yet. And finally, infections remain very high in children. And that is it from me. Thank you very much for all of that, Christina. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Helen Salisbury, who's going to say a few words about the scrapping of this self-isolation rule. Helen. Hello. Yes, um, I think we've all been a bit surprised by this sudden announcement um, I think members of, of SAGE and members of Indie SAGE, and as far as I can see, everybody, or well, nobody in any of those groups was expecting this sudden announcement. And it's quite difficult to see how, um, how it makes sense. Um, I think, as we've just seen from Christina's figures, numbers, although they may be coming down, luckily, we're pleased, we're delighted they're coming down, but they are still very, very high. Um, and it is a little bit difficult to see why in that context we would choose to scrap the requirement to self-isolate. I know the government uh, and the Prime Minister suggested that people will still, should still self-isolate um, if, they're, if they're not well and that would be the sensible thing to do. But I think that fails to recognise the reality of life for many, many people in this country. Uh, we have arguably have always had a rather unhealthy um, uh, work culture where you take your paracetamol and you go into work despite your cough and your runny nose and feeling a bit grotty and then you spread that to all your colleagues. Um, we've done that for years and luckily we stopped doing it with COVID because we were told we had to but it's really difficult to see how that's going to be for particularly people in insecure report employment will they get the support they need from their employers will they be you know if, if they're actually have mild symptoms from COVID. So this seems to be a policy that will increase and lead to rising numbers of COVID infections. Uh, and you may say, well, it's mild, does that really matter? And yes, it does really matter because it's not mild for everyone. As Christina has shown with those figures, there are still significant numbers of people, over 200 people a day are still dying from this Omicron variant. It is not just a mild, illness um, and there are people who are clinically vulnerable who um, will be restricted if we have further rises in, in cases their freedom is restricted by everybody going out whether or not they've got they they're infected or not and if we think if those numbers are one in 20 of of adults and much higher numbers of children if you go into any indoor space with more than 20 people, it's, you know, there's a fairly good chance you're going to meet someone with COVID. So that really restricts people. Those numbers go up, it gets even more dangerous and even more restrictive for vulnerable people. My last point on this is thinking about long COVID, which is going to be the focus of this session as well. People, there's a big message, COVID, this Omicron variant, it's mild. It's not necessarily mild. And we absolutely don't know about long COVID and Omicron and how those two um, fit together because it just hasn't been long enough to find out that figure but there's no we would be very foolhardy to suggest that long COVID isn't going to be a problem with this version of COVID as it clearly is with previous versions 
of COVID. So for those and many more reasons, which I'm sure you will all think of, actually lifting the requirement to self-isolate now seems to be not based on science. Thank you very much, that Helen. I mean, do we have any idea what the view of Sage itself is on this? Do, have we heard from Sage? Have we uh, have we any intimations of the of the scientific advice that the government is getting at the moment? Are they following the science? Uh, the only thing I've seen is a report from I think Robert Peston that uh, Sage had not been consulted um, and had not given their opinion. But there's only that one source. I don't know if anyone else has heard more. Thanks very much for that, Helen. And um, reading Richard Horton in The Lancet today, uh, you really chimed with what you were saying there about uh, about this this narrative, if I can use that overused word that's emerging about COVID now being mild, um, whilst um, COVID is actually the second largest killer in Europe after ischemic heart disease. Uh, this This is right here, right now. Okay, so uh, moving on now to um, Professor Martin McKee. Martin, I think you're going to say something about the COVID public inquiry. That's right. Thank you very much, Alice. So I really wanted to let our viewers know that we're going to have a slight change of emphasis in our meetings going forward, because we know that Baroness Hallett has been invited to chair the public inquiry for uh, England into the COVID response. And clearly over the past two years, we've been providing a lot of material that we feel will be very relevant for the inquiry to take into account. So what we're going to do is to look at how we can contribute as a group to that process. And next, so next week, we are going to have a session where we're going to look at the inquiry in general, look at inquiries and the lessons that have been learned. And then as we go forward, we're going to take some of the key themes as we see them and look at what we've said in the past and look at and, and invite other very experienced commentators to reflect with us on what some of those lessons might be. Now, we're going to be obviously uh, trying to fit that in with people's schedules, but on the 25th, we're going to be having a session on on schools and uh, children. And then on the 4th of March, uh, Sir Michael Marmot has agreed to talk with us. And we're trying to get a number of other speakers lined up. But as we go forward, we'll be taking these themes one by one, which we think are going to be some of the key issues that the inquiry will have to look at. Uh, so it'll be a slight departure from what we've done before, but we will continue with many of the same elements. Thank you very much, Martin. Now we're going to launch into our discussion on long COVID and children, and that's going to be led by Professor Anthony Costello. So, Anthony, over to you. Thanks, Alice. And uh, we're delighted to be joined by two real experts in, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Liz Whitaker, who's a consultant and a specialist in paediatric infectious diseases, and Dr. Benita Kane, who's a consultant in respiratory uh, medicine in, in South Manchester. I want to start with Liz. Um, we're going to have, I think, quite a lot of questions from the public about COVID in children and long COVID. What's your reading overall of the size of the COVID problem in children in terms of, let's start with deaths, multi-inflammatory syndrome, hospitalizations, and indeed, you know, long COVID? Yeah, thanks, Anthony, and thanks for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, so as a clinician working in the hospital, um, I think for the majority of paediatricians, the impression would be that COVID isn't something that's causing a huge problem. And the data we have from the first year of the pandemic would stand to that. So we've been in incredibly grateful that actually a very tiny minority of children are hospitalised. Um, of those who come in, many are actually incidental infections. Obviously, some children do experience severe infection and we want to do our best to protect them. And so uh, we've been really uh, grateful that the vaccine has been available and is now available for 5 to 11 year olds who are vulnerable, but also for over 12s. And we're really doing our best to advocate for uptake of the vaccine in those cohorts. Um, and in, in, in addition, doing huge amounts of work trying to get access to medicines for children, because all of the medicines we have are currently, there's only evidence for the over 18 year olds. And this is a huge hindrance for those who do become severely unwell. But that number of, of people is small and actually gets smaller with each wave, presumably due to prior infection. I think we will all acknowledge that children have, have uh, the majority of children have had COVID at this point in this country uh, due to uh, various mitigations that everyone's aware of. Um, and in terms of death, there are deaths, tragically, of both healthy and children who have underlying comorbidities. 
and we would like to avoid as many of these deaths as possible. Um, but from a clinician frontline working perspective, we don't see many of them, thankfully. The biggest thing that we see is the post-infectious complication multi-system inflammatory syndrome, as it's known in the US, or PIMS, as we try to call it in England on account of the summary drink that we all love. Um, and that um, affects a very small number of children, thankfully. Uh, when we first recognized it, those children presented late and actually had quite severe disease and the outcomes were worse. But over time, with education and increasing recognition, it is becoming a much more manageable condition. I think it's still very traumatic for the families who experience it, but actually with really quite good outcomes. And actually, our outcomes in the UK are much better than outcomes in other settings, in particular compared to the US, where they have different epidemiology, demographics and access to healthcare. I think we can be grateful with the NHS that people come early to hospital, whereas the delay um, because of fears of costs in other settings. Um, and that's probably, as a frontline clinician, what we mostly see is PIMS. So in terms of figures, I think about, I don't know the latest, but it's about 140 plus deaths so far in the UK and about... Yeah, I think... Two, sorry. Yeah, I think the death number gets very confusing because, as is acknowledged, we get uh, uh, the deaths within 28 days. But we also look separately at deaths of ever having a positive PCR because I think that's quite important to take into consideration in terms of what can happen. Um, but going back through notes to really have a close look and make sure that we know exactly what the cause of death was is a process that takes time. So there is an unfortunate lag. Um, there is work going on uh, with the same group that published the data from the first year of the pandemic to be certain exactly um, what, who, which of those deaths were due to the virus and which weren't. And yeah. I think that's really important to inform policy um, and to identify the appropriate children to, to make sure that they're protected as much as possible um, uh, going forward. So I think that number is unclear. So I think around 130 is the number that comes across uh, in the last two years. Long COVID, there's a, a, a slight sort of mismatch between the ONS figures and what, you know, tertiary paediatricians would say, because they tend not to see long mm. COVID uh, as much. And maybe in primary care, that's seen a bit more, or a lot is flying under the radar. I mean, the latest uh, ONS data I looked at said that, and, and in fact, Christina showed it, is that uh, between two young people, you know, from two to 24, 225,000 have had, you know, symptoms of long COVID and about half that number for longer than 12 weeks. So it seems there is a bigger problem here. Is But have you seen much in the way of long COVID? Yeah, so you may know that I've been involved in establishing services for children who are experiencing persistent symptoms. We started that in November 2020 with the recognition that was an unmet need. Um, there are now 15 MDTs that, that try and assess these children across the country. And I think what we're, um, what, what is good and bad is that we see very, very small numbers in those services. I, and we are concerned about access to those services and we worry that the message isn't out there. So we are doing active case finding through schools, uh, but also making sure we do education with primary care to say, look, you need to be aware that missing school is an emergency for a child. And if they're missing school because of persistent symptoms, they really must access care as quickly as possible. Um, I think that there is a, a discrepancy between persistent symptoms, which I think are relatively common, um, and those children who experience the extreme end of the spectrum for whom this is a very debilitating disease. Um, and we, um, and the good news is that we are seeing recovery. So we're trying to get that data together because I think that's really important for the families and the children themselves, especially to know that actually on the whole, the vast majority of children with the right input are making good progress. Um, and so we will try and get that out as soon as possible um, for the families. But we really, the push is to understand what it is, uh, what causes it, how we can prevent it, how we can best manage it. Um, in order to do the best for those children who are experiencing those symptoms. But the, the number who access care and the number who report symptoms are quite different numbers. And that, that's a really important area of research, I think. Yeah. Thanks. I'll come back in a moment. But Benita, you, you've um, had personal experience of childhood long COVID. And I wonder if you could perhaps talk a little bit about that and how worried you are about it. And especially the effects, uh, you know, the more serious effects on the brain 
such as fatigue, brain fog, loss of taste and smell, and even cognitive impairment. Yeah, thank you, um, Liz, and thank you, Anthony. Uh, so my my eleven now eleven year old, she was a very happy, healthy ten year old girl when she got unwell with COVID in January twenty twenty one, so over twelve months ago. Um, and she was someone who, well, she was just led a normal life, liked being active, sporty, particularly enjoyed um, gymnastics and hanging out with her friends and. Unfortunately, um, even though she had quite a mild illness to start with, she just really never quite recovered. And it wasn't until she was ill in the January, it wasn't really until around the, the March, um, April time, when they went back to school after the lockdown and the online learning stopped, that we realised just how affected she was. And within a couple of weeks of being back at school full time, she'd completely crashed. And that's when we sort of realised this isn't just a prolonged recovery, there's something really wrong here. Um, I was lucky enough to to have um, good support and, and, and medical care. I mean, clearly, I'm a, I'm a doctor myself, uh, but that hasn't made it easy being on the other side of the system at all. And we, there has been an explosion in, in research in the adult world, which has been very helpful. And some of the some of the effects you've mentioned around um, brain health are concerning. But I do think that having that research that knowledge is power and at least us as parents feel that now that we have got some underlying research we can really start to think about what we can do about this problem and we know for example that uh, virus persists in tissues there's been there's been studies showing that often for for many many months after people have been infected we know from the adult population that this is looking like it's a multi-system blood vessel disorder that's why it affects so many organs like the brain and the heart and the gut and the nerves and so I think from my perspective we can't currently predict at all with any certainty which child will suffer which child won't so it's a bit of a lottery and in my world we talk about translational research so it's going from lab to bedside and and getting that research translated into stuff that is going to really help our children and I feel that there is an urgency to do this now at pace and scale so we're really fantastically lucky to have clinicians like Liz who've set up services and are trying their absolute best but I know from the other side as Liz has pointed out that there are many 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 families and children struggling to access services and they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because they're on these long waiting lists to be seen but they can't attend school they're getting pressure to attend school because of attendance GPs are struggling to know how to help or are maybe not confident to make the diagnosis. There's a lot of kids who are in limbo, missing out on education. And my daughter's world has been is absolutely unrecognisable from what it was 18 months ago. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment about what parents can do to support a child with long COVID. But just um, coming back to Liz, I, I just want to ask a bit about immunisation and vaccination of children, because... Britain has been much slower than the United States and Europe. Um, and, the, you know, they took the view initially that they were worried about side effects of the vaccine in, in relation to the uh, effects of the virus. But I think most people around the world and gradually we have realised that the effects of infection are worse than any risks due to the vaccination. Do you think we should be vaccinating all children down to the age of five, as they are doing in the United States? And if so, how many doses should we be giving them? I think these are million dollar questions. Uh, um, so we have to remember what the vaccine does. And I think that it's not a panacea. So it, uh, it, the effect of the vaccine is to, de to decrease severe disease, hospitalization and death. That's what we know, that's the evidence. Um, that it decreases infection, but it doesn't prevent it. Um, and when it comes to the complications of infection, like PIMS or MIS-C and long COVID, there is some very uh, preliminary data that shows it may be protective for PIMS and MIS-C, which is, for me, a bit of a game changer in terms of how I would view uh, vaccinating five to 11 year olds, because the, the, the most common age we see that in is eight and nine year olds. Um, uh, and now that there is really nice safety data from the US, uh, they've given about 6 million doses and um, with a lower dose vaccine than we were giving in the older children and the adults um, and not seeing any complications. I think that we should revisit the need for vaccination in that age group. Um, however, 
in just talking about pins for a moment, I'll come back to long COVID. With this Omicron wave where we've seen many infections in that age group, actually we haven't seen the subsequent uh, wave of PIMS uh, that are protective effect of prior infection. So the additive benefit of uh, a dose or multiple doses becomes a big and important question. Personally, I think that substantiating the protective effect of the infection with a dose of vaccine is likely to be beneficial, but I do not think that we have evidence that three doses or two doses is, is necessarily necessary and is, is it helpful. So I think we need better data on that. Um, and I think that will come from the US. So to my mind, and the other question that's difficult is if you start vaccinating that age group, where does that resource come from and how does that impact on other programs for healthcare in that area? So I think that it's complicated, but on the whole, I think a dose at least going into the next wave, which I'm sure we're going to see, unfortunately, going into the summer would, to my mind, be a sensible uh, thing to do. With regard, key, sorry. No, I was just going to say a, a key question is whether or not uh, vaccination reduces the risk of long COVID, because yeah. that is likely to be the most common problem for younger children. Is, is there any evidence on that? I think we just don't know. I think if I'm completely hand on heart, there is there's some conflicting evidence. Um, yeah. uh, so if you decrease infection, it seems to stand to account that you will decrease long COVID because that's a direct relationship. Um, and what we don't know is if how much long COVID occurs after a second infection. So if you've had infection before and you have a second infection, can you go on to get long COVID in the same way? or is there some protective benefit of the first episode of infection? And that's really important in understanding whether vaccination will be protective. And some people with long COVID have had a benefit of being vaccinated, but some actually have had a deterioration of their symptoms. So I think it's an area that we, we can't base a decision to vaccinate on the information we have so far, unfortunately, but we really need to do those studies. So we're trying to get funding for a study to look at precisely this in young people. Um, as Anita said, we, Research in this area desperately needs to be done because this isn't going away. Um, you know, it isn't over. Um, and we really need to be prepared to go into the next few years with um, evidence bases to make decisions. Thanks very much, Liz. And if you can hang around, I'm sure there's going to be some questions. I know you have to go by 2.30, but um, yeah, just you. finally, Benita, I mean, from your experience, there may be a lot of people listening or uh, right now who who have a child with long COVID. What advice would you give about how uh, a parent can support a child with long COVID? I think the first really important message is believe your child. They, they don't want to be ill and they're not making this up and it's not anxiety. And I've heard some horrendous stories about their symptoms being dismissed. And then parents do question themselves if a healthcare professional is saying that. So I think please believe your children when they're telling you they're not well. We do know that exertion can make a certain proportion of children worse. So I learned that the hard way by sort of saying, oh, well, you know, go into school, you'll be all right type thing early on. Um, actually did make her worse. So I don't feel particularly good about that, but I didn't know any better at the time. There's an absolutely fantastic support group called Long COVID Kids, where I have found a huge amount of information and help and support. And I've actually been able to connect Jasmine to um, other children who are in the same boat, which is really important because it can be a very lonely and isolating experience for these kids. And lastly, I would say there may be because of the way Ofsted works and the pressure that schools have for children to attend, there is sometimes undue pressure to send children into school, particularly from the schools um, who maybe don't have much experience with long COVID. So it's making sure you have the medical support for a diagnosis, a medical plan with the school and doing what is best for the child. Uh, you know your children best. Thank you so much, both of you. I know, Alice, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So shall we take those now? Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Anthony. And uh, thank you very much, Benita and Liz as well. And uh, yeah, I do hope you can stay with us because we have got some questions coming in about long COVID in children. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite John Siddle to ask a question. John Siddle of the Sunday Mirror. John, are you there? Okay, well, moving on then, I will invite 
Seely. Seely Barbaria. Sorry, it's Selly. Selly. Sorry about that. Selly, what's your question? I, I think actually Liz already answered it. I mean, um, I'm a parent of two primary aged kids. Um, and although we haven't been offered the chance to vaccinate them yet, uh, I would really like to have that chance. Um, but I'm most concerned about long COVID for them. Um, and so really I was looking for, is there any evidence that the vaccines can protect against uh, long COVID? But Liz already actually talked about that. Yeah, I think I think you said it was fairly inconclusive at the moment, didn't you, Liz? But there, there is evidence that the vaccines are protecting against the, uh, the sort of shorter term worst effects of COVID. Yeah, and it decreases the risk of infection, which will then pretend, protect, protect against long COVID. So I think that, you know, it's a likely benefit, but we don't have conclusive evidence. A couple of weeks ago, there was a paper, of, I think it was from Israel, uh, looking at uh, long COVID effects from vaccines. And I think that was more in older yeah. patients, uh, but it did seem to reduce by half the numbers in that study. As I recall, Danny shaking his head, maybe he has more details. Yeah, no, no, simply, you've, you've said it right. So um, it's all we've got to, got to hang on to at the moment. But, you know, as Liz said, you know, it's intuitive that if you're talking about um, effective vaccination on less COVID and therefore less long COVID, um, you know, that's the first paper where, you know, which does show that. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much, Danny. I mean, we've we've had MHRA approval, haven't we, of the, of the vaccines for five to 11 year olds. And I think most European countries are well into vaccinating their five to 11 year olds. I think I'm, I think I'm right in saying that. Martin? Yes, you are. Uh, they, but many other countries are already doing so. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to another question then. Um, Mary Ion, Mary. Hi. Welcome, what's your question? My question is, well, it's sort of two questions in one. Um, what should the standard of care be nationally for identifying and treating long COVID in kids? And how should this be integrated with the Department for Education to provide more support for families? Thank you very much. Benita, is that something that you'd like to start with? I can only really come at this from uh, the perspective of a parent. Um, and, you know, I'm really pleased you've asked that question, Mary, because I think this is what people really struggle with the most. Uh, as far as I know, and Liz might um, correct me, there isn't an internationally agreed consensus as a definition in children. Well, certainly last time I, I looked and that doesn't help. It also doesn't help that um, it, many children who are suffering with the symptoms don't have maybe didn't have a positive PCR children are quite hard to swab and so if you get I know I know this myself if you're trying to swab a child it's quite difficult so getting the diagnosis confirmed um, because clearly there are other respiratory um, symptoms and other symptoms that are common in children so that really clouds clouds a lot of the research I think in terms of the Department of Education I absolutely agree we need a we need a proper uh, policy from them and not only just for the children with long COVID but also children who've suffered with ME-CFS who often have the same range of, of problems and people often have battled for years and years to get the right support so I, I, I live this and breathe this and feel it in the in the patient group that these are real real problems and I would love to see a bigger focus on it from the Department of Education. Thanks very much, Benita. Liz, could I bring you back in as well to answer this? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think we've developed pathways nationally which have been shared um, across primary and secondary care uh, for this. Uh, actually, having a positive COVID test isn't a prerequisite. We really wanted to have um, access because it's a real recognition. You know, many children are symptomatic, mainly pick up the infection. Um, and so that shouldn't be a hindrance to accessing care. There is a research definition that's recently uh, come through the clock um, that's more stringent than I think the clinical definition, because you have to have quite stringent definitions for research um, from adults. And it's really important to recognise that long COVID in kids is not the same as long COVID in adults. And long COVID in itself is a massive umbrella term that probably encompasses lots of different conditions. And so when we talk about treatment, it's not like there is a treatment. 
there are lots of symptomatic appropriate treatments that we can try and there will be experimental treatments and we're trying to get access to adult trials for those so the pathway would be that if a child is experiencing symptoms for more than four weeks if more than 12 weeks then they should be able to uh, see the care who may do some simple measures in the first instance but if they're clearly debilitated should rapidly escalate to pediatrics and we have asked all pediatricians uh, dhs district general hospitals to a pediatrician who could see these children rapidly so they shouldn't go onto a long pediatric outpatient wait list. I'm aware that's a challenge in some areas and doesn't necessarily follow through and we have said in some instances they can be referred directly on to the actual MDTs um, and there can be um, a variety of different um, symptoms and it's very broad, very open for that reason. But in terms of treatment it is uh, support of symptoms and and as you say, Benita, this is very much about recognising what each child needs um, and making sure that there's a gradual return to activity and that education is absolutely crucial here. We've been trying to work with patients, get from schools and head teachers and welfare officers so they know how to school or coming in for social bits in school, if nothing else, and then doing education at home. So I completely agree with what you said there. Liz, thanks very much for that. Um, we've got a pretty poor connection, but I think I could I could get the gist of what Sorry. you were saying. So, um, thank you very much, Martin. I, um, you you noted that actually there's there's some effort going into um, looking at optimal clinical pathways across Europe here. That's right. Yes, I, I sit on the European Commission's expert panel on effective ways of investing in health, and we've just uh, started the process of writing a report that will look at essentially what the different parts of the European Union can do to support this. So we're discuss, uh, we've got observers from the Research and Development uh, Director General from the European Centre for Disease Control and from DG Sante, the Health Director General, uh, who are the, the sponsors of the um, the uh, of, of the panel uh, who it reports to, and uh, so we will be looking at all of these issues. In particular, looking at what advice can be given to governments, to the European agencies, and it will include trying to pull together as much expertise as we can to come up with some ideas around clinical pathways. But clearly, drawing on the very and the wealth of work which is going on in um, in other in member states and 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 in the UK as well. Thanks very much, Martin. Thank you very much for that question, Mary. And now on to a question from Sylvia Draver. Silva, Sylvia, are you there? I think I can see you there. Hello. What's sorry. Question, Sylvia? <laughs> Hi, sorry about that. Um, yes, I think part of my question has already been answered, which was about um, vaccination and long COVID. Um, but I've got two under fives and um, and that was my main concern really was about them and if they got infected and their chances of long COVID. I took um, I took a career break to basically look after them to because the nurseries and stuff wouldn't put in um, some of the mitigations which I thought that they should do. Um, so I was just wondering because my whole family think that I'm basically a bit mad in in doing this and that kids are fine and they don't get affected and stuff. So I was just wondering if anyone knows like what the youngest age in terms of like long COVID is. I assume it's like hard to tell because kids can't really communicate that well. And um, whether people think we'll ever get like a vaccine for under fives eventually. I think in, they're looking for emergency approval of Pfizer in America at the moment, but it just feels like a long wait. I was kind of hoping end of last year, I've got to go back to work in July. <laughs> um, so I'd like to know people's thoughts on when we might get one. And, you know, thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. It is, it's just so tricky, isn't it, as a parent? I mean, I think that, you know, while, while adults have are enjoying the the choice are enjoying the choice of being able to um be able to have access to these to these vaccines mm. and obviously our over 12s are now able to um i i mean i feel your frustration in terms of having um children who are slightly too young at the moment to have the um the over 12 vaccine um but what about even younger children then um you know how do, how does covid affect even younger children under the age of 5 where are we at with thinking about vaccines for, for that particular age group? I wonder if um, Anthony or, or Martin have, have any kind of ideas about that. 
Well, just on the figures from ONS, which I'm looking at, is that the percentage that of the population, I think um, Christina showed this, is about 0.5% in the age group 2 to 11. So that's one in 200, basically. Now, that may be what's reported in a questionnaire. Then people say, well, you need a comparison group. And so there have been studies done where you compare sending questionnaires out to people that you know have had COVID and that those haven't. The problem with those studies is that all when I've been doing big follow-up studies, we were always told you need to get uh, at least 70% of follow-up in both groups in order to compare them adequately. If you have much smaller numbers, it's unreliable. And in these studies, you do have differences between the uh, and the numbers are actually quite small. They're way below 70%. They're often below 40%. So it is difficult to interpret. But there are three or four symptoms that really come out of those studies that are significantly higher in the those that have had COVID compared to the others. And they those are, you know, the, the extreme fatigue, the brain fog, the loss of taste and smell, and some respiratory issues. So... You know, uh, in terms of vaccines, we're going to need new vaccines anyway if we're going to vaccinate mm -hmm. the world because Pfizer and Moderna, although they're effective, are losing effectiveness with time. And also, um, you know, a lot of people are saying we need a uh, vaccine. Well, I think Danny should be talking about this. Vaccines that attack the whole virus, not just mm -hmm. the spike protein. But whether we'll get those and whether they'll be appropriate for under fives is a, a much bigger question, I think. And maybe in, interestingly, in the US, it was the FDA who asked Pfizer to submit a, a, a proposal for approval rather than the other way around. It's normally the company submits the approval uh, and that would be for six to six months to four years. And it would be, I think, a tenth of the, uh, the, the adult dose. But others will know more about that. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. I, yeah, I wonder if I could bring Danny in. I'm happy to comment, but can, can I go to Liz Whitaker first? It looks like she's dying to say something and has oh, a, a lot of expertise yeah, on this. <laughs> enthusiastic on this topic. It's very <laughs> difficult. There is no data in this age group. They've been using a three microgram dose of Pfizer, which is, as you say, a tenth of the 30 micrograms to give adults. And they're now trying a third dose to see if they can get effective immune responses, mm -hmm. um, which so it's a bit tricky. So the question is whether they know go back and do the dose they did for five to 11 year olds. So we just don't have data in that age group yet. And it's really extraordinary. They're asking for emergency authorization without evidence because that's I think I think that's tricky, to be honest. Um, and but it's also tricky because that's an age group where you're already giving lots of other vaccines to, which are really important. And every time you add something else into that mix, you could potentially make those vaccines less effective. So just particularly the under twos. So the two to five is a bit more simple. They only get a preschool booster. But in the under twos, those vaccine trials have to take into account whether they're going to influence measles vaccine responses. And um, we know that we're worried about a measles outbreak in this country um, or other vaccine responses, which we know are life-saving. So it's very complicated field introducing new vaccines in those age groups. So please bear with everyone while they try and do the trials properly so that we know that, you know, everything you do has an equal and opposite reaction. Everything we do has to make sure that we balance out those risks as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Liz. Uh, Danny, can I bring you in finally on this question? Yeah, I, 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 all I can add is one sentence, just that, um, you know, there are more than 100 other vaccines out there, except for, you know, the famous ones that we all know that are in development. And so it's, it's early days for our COVID yeah. vaccines. And you know lots of stuff still to do and lots of progress to watch in other countries thanks very much danny sylvia thank you very much for that thank question you. and um moving on now to richard harrison richard harrison are you there and have you got a question for us yes um hello again um it looks as though the government in England's abandoning all legal measures to control the spread of the virus and even abandoned the ONS prevalence surveys. Um, what might be a question for their government's lawyers is given this situation is avoidable by keeping simple measures that don't amount to lockdown. How can these changes in government policy possibly be compatible with equality and human rights legislation? But my question for the panel is, is more practical. If we're going to be forced to live with COVID at high prevalence, despite the continuing issue of new variants, what needs to be done on an ongoing basis to protect the immune compromised and vulnerable, 
So they're not faced with the invidious choice of either being exposed to the risk of serious illness and death, which could be unquantifiable if we don't have these um, data, or excluding themselves from a large part of normal life more or less permanently. Thank you very much, Richard, um, for that really important question. I mean, if we do have a large pool of circulating virus, then then it is to a large extent sink or swim uh, for vulnerable people. Um, I wonder if I could bring in Steve Reicher to talk about this. Steve, are you are you up for responding to this this question? And then Susan. Well, it was a very good question, and I mean, in, in many ways, the, the question itself um, uh, outlines the key issues. I and mean, the notion that what we're getting is freedom, no, it's not. It's freedom for some to do what they like, irrespective of the consequences for, for others, which takes their freedom away. It's the, it's the freedom of the fit and the healthy and the privileged to act however they like uh, without taking into account the consequences. But I do think there are some things uh, that we can do, and some things we might have to do despite the government. One is, is the scheme that we're working away on, which is the scores on the doors um, scheme, uh, which we're beginning to pilot in various places. And the idea is to give people clear information about levels of ventilation in different spaces. That's something we hope will be taken up by all sorts of bodies. We're trialing it in schools, we're trialing it in universities, we hope that it might be trialed in restaurants and pubs and so on. That's number one, clear information to people about what is safe and what isn't safe. And secondly, I go back to the fact that even if we are fit and we are healthy, then Always doing things like wearing a mask was never for us as individuals. It was for us as a community. And therefore, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to act in ways that make the most vulnerable feel safe. I, I go back, and I know I've quoted it before, but I think it is a principle we should remember. It's Gandhi's old quote about the mark of a civilization is how we treat the most vulnerable. And that's a question not only to our government, but to each of us as individuals. We should all be acting to keep the most vulnerable amongst us as safe as possible. Thank you, Steve. And Professor Susan Mickey, I know that you wanted to respond as well. Yes, I think um, a couple of the main dangers for um, those of us who are clinically vulnerable or extremely clinical vulnerable are social isolation and restricted activities. And so the key basic things that can be done is um, when going out, ensure that you have high grade masks, the FFP2 masks that really do make a difference. Um, encourage those around you uh, to, to wear masks where they can. Avoid the high risk situations of indoor, um, poorly ventilated places. And in your own home, um, there is a possibility of actually um, getting air filtration units if you don't have enough ventilation or don't want to let in cold air. So I think there are things that can be done to ensure that social contact carries on and as much um, activity as possible. But it's going to be really difficult, as Steve says, unless the government changes policy and unless we get these transmission rates down. Thank you very much, Susan. And um, Steve Griffin, you'd like to comment too. Yeah, thanks. Um, I completely agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think the issues with what's happening at the moment are that ignoring prevalence is a major mistake. And we've had ideas about how to deal with this pandemic around people who are fit and healthy being able to carry on and protecting those who are vulnerable. I don't think vulnerable people necessarily want to be protected. I think it's quite disabling further for vulnerable people to be you know, hemmed in that way. We can't always identify people that are vulnerable and we can't identify people who will become vulnerable. We're only one trip to the doctors away from becoming vulnerable. And I think that, that the, the negligence involved in allowing high levels of transmission is, is fundamentally wrong because of that. And if we don't get on top of transmission for those reasons, we, we're, we're just going to count the costs in those people that are less able to get on. And I think it's fundamentally wrong. Thank you very much, Steve. I mean, it's um, really reassuring to hear of um, schemes like the like the scheme that you were talking about, Steve, with you know trialing, making environments safer. I mean, that's what we need to do, isn't it? Rather than relying on individuals to 
to protect themselves um, actually create safer environments. So how will we find out more about those schemes? Well, I mean, at the moment, they're in, they're in the process of trialling and refining. And then we're going to um, uh, approach various bodies, um, including uh, governments, because remember, there's not just the UK government. And when we talk about government, it's only the UK government, which has uh, um, uh, taken the step of announcing uh, that all uh, restrictions will be lifted. So um, if anybody has any contacts with any organisations, any companies, then please let us know because we want to go to as many people as possible. Um, and I would argue that not only is this good for public health, I think it is also good economically. People are more likely to use uh, spaces if they know those spaces to, to, uh, are safe. So I think it will be in the interests of all, of, of businesses, of public organisations, and of, uh, of, of society at large, if we go ahead with these things. So help us, please, and we'll do what we can. Thank you very much, Steve, indeed. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one final question then uh, from Louise Flanagan. Louise. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about the likelihood of long COVID recurring. Um, so we think we had it quite early in the pandemic. And um, I've got an eight and 11 year old now. The youngest was asymptomatic. The other three of us were mildly ill. Um, and we all, but we did all suffer long COVID. Um, so the now 11 year old uh, got off lightly in comparison, I suppose, at nine months. But obviously it was very unpleasant doesn't want to repeat. We've been super careful not to get COVID again, um, despite the fact that school is full of it and it's very difficult. Obviously, they can't access vaccination. That's been a bit of a difficulty for our family. So we just wondered, is the risk actually higher for a child that's had long COVID before? Um, or does it really not make much difference? Thank you, Louise. I'm really sorry to hear about the, the impact there on, on your family. Um, Liz, could I bring you back in for this question? Yeah. I'm sorry that you've had such a difficult time, but I'm glad to hear that you've recovered. And I have to be honest and say, I don't think we know if, um, because we don't understand what causes it, it's impossible to predict whether it could come back. Um, uh, and I know for, and Lisa mentioned earlier, the chronic fatigue syndrome, medically unexplained symptoms, and young people who experience those, some of those young people have had um, worse symptoms with COVID. So I think there is plausibility that it could come back, but I don't know that we have any evidence to say whether it will or not. Um, and so I'm sorry that we can't give you a definite answer on that. Um, Thank you very much indeed, Liz. Um, but Louise, it sounds, uh, sounds as though you're completely right to continue to be cautious then, um, not knowing whether, whether actually you could end up with long COVID again. I'm going to draw it to a close there, unless anybody else is desperate to jump in at this point. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you especially to our two special guests, uh, Dr. Manita Kane and Dr. Liz Whitaker, and to Anthony Costello for chairing that part of the discussion. And thank you very much, Benita and Liz, for, for sticking around for all these questions from, from the public. Thank you very much for bringing your questions to us. Um, and thank you to all the scientists of Independent Sage for your continued hard work, assessing the data, sharing it with the public, and supporting this much needed channel of communication between experts and the public. Thank you to everybody who's uh, watching, whether that's live or on catch up. We'll be here again next week to listen to your concerns and answer your questions. Stay safe and keep well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.